Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Tech Forum session. I'm Lauren Stewart, the Conferences Director at BookNet Canada. Welcome to Serving Communities in Crisis, the Booksellers Role, co-presented by the Canadian Independent Booksellers Association. Founded in 2020, CUBA offers programs and services to Canadian independent booksellers and advocates to support the strengthening of the independent bookselling sector. They're funded by the Government of Canada through the Canada Book Fund. To get in touch with CIBA, visit their website, cibabooks.ca or email info at cibabooks.ca. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to recognize that BookNet Canada acknowledges its staff work upon the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous peoples, the original nations of this land. We endorse the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and support an ongoing shift from gatekeeping to space making in the book industry. Now, let me introduce our moderator, Tim Middleton. Tim is a project manager and retail liaison at BookNet Canada. With a passion for startup culture, entrepreneurial enterprises, and disruptive technology ignited by a varied career in retail and consumer research, all things bookish remain his first and true love. We also have our booksellers joining us for our discussion today. Laura Ash is the co-owner of Another Story Bookshop in the Roncesvalles neighborhood in Toronto. Drawn to Another Story for its commitment to making a social impact through books, Laura is determined to ensure Sheila Kaufman's legacy lives on and Another Story continues to bring alternative titles to a new generation of reader. Shelley Macbeth is the owner of Blue Heron Books in Uxbridge, Ontario, two-time winner of the Libris Award, Best Bookstore in Canada, and named as a favorite by the legendary Stuart McLean, Blue Heron Books values its location in a 200-year-old building located in the busy and popular shopping area once frequented by former resident Lucy Maud Montgomery. The store is a hub for the community and a bastion of calm chaos where everyone is welcome. Catherine Ellesmere, along with Nikki Brewer, co-founded Odin Books in Vancouver 30 years ago in response to a need to find a way to normalize the discussion of mental health and why it's important. Over the years, they have grown and adapted to support the changing community and the increasing need to continue the conversation around mental health. Catherine has a background in business and educational com communications, as well as extensive volunteer work. The bookstore is a great way to combine these skills to serve the community. Over to you, Tim. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, Shelley, Catherine, Laura. I wanted to uh, start off on a personal note, let our conversation start there, and just go around the table or the Zoom room and uh, have everyone tell us uh, one at a time how you got into bookselling, what's your favorite thing you've ever done as a bookseller, and what's your vision for your bookstore? So I know that these are pretty big questions that, you know, Hopefully you're not put on the spot. Um, and uh, I'm sure you have a ready answer. Uh, if not, you can just use my intro that I just gave you. So um, let's start out in Vancouver, BC with Catherine, uh, Catherine Elsmere, mm -hmm. and then over to Toronto with Laura. And we'll uh, come back to Uxbridge to hear from Shelley. So Catherine, if you need me to repeat anything, feel free. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start with, um, we, Nikki and I started the bookstore over 30 years ago. We both have had extensive, done a lot of big volunteer work with various groups, whether it's uh, sexual assault survivors, domestic violence um, survivors. I've worked um, with individuals who are, were incarcerated as well. So we have kind of a vast background in concerns about how mental health was viewed in the community and accessibility to resources. I spent some time up in the Northwest Territory, so I'm very aware, although there is a wonderful bookstore there, I am very aware that it is hard to get um, good resources on mental health. And in the 90s, it was almost unheard of. Um, so that's how it all began, started it as a little home-based business. I think I was mentioning earlier, we were, you know, taping our hair to people's packages. We were, because we were doing a mail order at that time. And, uh, who knew it would evolve to where it is now, but, um, and that's sort of been how, and then we moved to a retail space and have since grown and evolved based on uh, consumer demand, whatever our customers were letting us know they were looking for. Um, certainly uh, initially the sex abuse survivors, domestic violence um, survivors, anybody who's experienced trauma also has experiences with anxiety, depression, their parents there, they've got children who have special requirements sometimes. So we do the mental health and the special needs and special education piece exclusively. 
Um, our biggest, probably my favorite thing is actually seeing how we finally, after 30 years, we talk about mental health um, and it doesn't have the stigma it did initially. And people can be more open to saying there's dealing with anxiety, and especially during COVID, we're seeing just a huge spike in people who normally have been able to manage whatever was going on for them. Now it's, it's becoming something that they need support with. So there is a need for more of a need for resources and people to support these individuals. So if you, um, like even people who have had trauma, it can be just spiked um, because of what's happening certainly in, in uh, the community. Um, so that's, I think my favorite thing, my, my vision ultimately and the ultimate goal that we've always had with Good Bookstore and I hope it will continue is just for society to look at mental health the way they look at physical health. So the fact that your brain is unwell is no different than your heart not being unwell or your kidneys or your liver or any other part of your body. But somehow we've managed to separate them as two different things and we treat them as there's something wrong with you if your brain's not working, but it's not your fault if you need support for your heart or support for other parts of your body. So it's a very interesting contrast and we really want to bring those two things together. I think it's so important that we do not isolate um, those two the way we do or have been so that's my thing <laughs> thanks Catherine uh, and uh, over to Laura another story uh, is a little different um I uh didn't find like I, I'm not the founder of another story Sheila Kaufman is I took over in 2017 um after her passing um I I got into the bookstore scene from my local hometown bookshop. Uh, I was a, um, a customer there and they were hiring. And I just so happened to know the owner's husband who was a teacher of mine. And she just kind of took me under her wing, taught me everything that she knew. Um, Susan, Susan Chamberlain from The Bookkeeper, she is my book mom and uh -huh. I a lot to her. Um, from there, I moved to Montreal, worked at Paragraph, and then moved to Toronto in 2012, started working with another story. Um, the bookshop, like I said, has been around for 35 years, started off in this really small basement on the Danforth, um, and mm -hmm. eventually moved to a storefront around Broadview, and then to Roncesvalles High Park area, um, where we still currently are. Uh, the store focuses on social justice and uh, diversity, equity. We cater to school boards and organizations and um, the, our commitment to our community is just to try to make sure that the store um, really like re represents and reflects um, the, the people we support. So, you know, uh, that's with our events, that's with our like book fairs that we do for schools. Um, we look at class issues and, and all sorts of all sorts of things. So that's that's what we do, and that's uh, that's what we hope for in the future that we can continue to start seeing um, the industry catch up with us. Uh, we've been doing this for thirty five years. That has been our special thirty five years, um, and uh, I think Sheila would be happy that. The industry has been moving in the right direction. We are not there yet, but we are making strides. So that's another story bookshop. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, Shelley, how are things in Uxbridge? Well, um, I guess we what we share, the three of us, is that we're in the 30 plus year old category. Um, and I, I won't say there the resemblance ends because um, although I am in a small rural community, um, Uxbridge is about 20,000 strong, um, we're like 50 minutes, five zero minutes from King Bay. So we are kind of 
that bed, I wouldn't call it bedroom community, but we're commutable. Remember commuting when you got in your car and drove to work? <laughs> um, but we are definitely home to a lot of Torontonians, myself included, um, you know, people who wanted to have a more rural lifestyle, so decided to move to the boonies. So in that respect, we have to be a generalist because we are the bookstore. I, I do, I will point out that there was a Coles in town. I was around when it opened, 2006, and around blissfully when it closed, 2019. So that is, was a bit of a feather in our cap, but um, we are kind of the only game in town. And so you, you're a generalist, but we're also a specialist in a lot of respects. I mean, we have a cooking school next door to us. So we do an awful lot of cooking events and cookbook author type things, which is, you know, hugely successful. Everybody likes to eat. Um, we are the trail capital of Canada. So we have a lot of specialty along the lines of maps and guidebooks and that sort of thing. We are the Ontario home of the uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery Society of Ontario where um, Maud wrote 11 of her 22 novels here. So that brings in a tourist trade to some extent. And coincidentally, I'm childhood friends with Kate McDonald who is Lucy Maud Montgomery's granddaughter. So that has been very handy when we do any sort of Anna Green Cables event. Um, so, and, and then we also, really specialize I would say in in children's books like half of our store pretty much is children's books and that I guess I would have to say is my my mission is to see the next generation of readers come along um, I've been around long enough now that I am seeing the the children of and the grandchildren of and it's kind of scary kind of lovely kind of scary because it just shows you how old you are but it's delightful too, to have someone who you saw as a tiny child choosing a book come in with their child and really eager to show them, this is the bookstore that I used to come to. And so that new generation of readers, that's kind of uh, a mission for me, as well as I'm very much in the more Canada um, bracket. I really try to encourage and um, make sure that front first and foremost I'm going to present a Canadian book to someone because we we are the culture mongers if you will and if we can't you know show a Canadian book first I think we've got a big problem so anyway that that's Blue Heron in Uxbridge. Awesome that's great thank you I I should probably give my uh book selling cred as well uh I obviously got into book selling well, not obviously, I got into bookselling ages ago when I, I realized books were the way to learn things. <laughs> and uh, so I worked at the University Bookstore here in Guelph, also the bookshelf uh, in Guelph, Ontario as well. I'm from Guelph. I used to be one of those commuters um, in the go train, not the, not the uh, car. But um, so I just uh, realized, you know, we have oh, hundreds of years of bookselling wisdom here on this panel. Uh, my own experience of bookselling, when I was a bookseller specifically, uh, there were always problems. Uh, I think they were probably different for me as a bookseller versus the owners of the bookstore, but I just wanted you to sort of focus in right now and this isn't specifically about COVID yet, but what, um, what's the biggest problem for book selling right, right now? And by right now, I mean beyond pandemic, beyond anything. What are booksellers, what's keeping them up at night right now? What's keeping you up at night? What's, what's the biggest problem? And maybe we'll start in Toronto with Laura this time, or... You can pass, by the way. Don't feel that you have to. Um, so I, I would say that of, of the last, you know, since 2012, working at Another Story as a bookseller and now as co-owner, um, we, are, we are actually in like a pretty like interesting spot where I think we like consistently year over year have done better. And that's 
And that's like also like, you know, the learning curve of becoming a new owner and feeling more comfortable. So like, so right now I feel really good about where we're at. Um, as far as what our biggest pain point is right now, I would have to say um, it's, it's always, it will always be this, but is, it's always trying to compete with online. And for mm -hmm. us, it's, it's the, sh the shipping that comes with it. It's the, the demand of, you know, next day delivery. And there's things that we can do and we can say that, you know, well, we have, we provide this service and that service and we give back to your community and we just gave, you know, $2,000 here or there, but people don't seem to really understand that. So it's really trying to build that connection with the community that it's um, shopping with us is more than just, um, you know, you feel good because you support a local indie. Is that we're actually putting money back into the community not just with our tax dollars, of course, and the fact that we're mm -hmm. with people who are local, but the fact that, you know, it's like we, we are there, we do show up, we, we sell at your book fairs, we, you know, uh, we host your author events, we, uh, we do all these little things, uh, we connect people within communities, we help organizations. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the biggest thing. And I think with everything being online and everything, and not just with, not just with mm -hmm. going online, but it's really for us, you know, how do we engage effectively online? Because that's the platform of today, right? So, and that's something that just in the last couple of years, we had to have like a Twitter and an Instagram. And I don't have any of those things. So for me to try and get caught up with all of that, and, and I'm of the generation that, you know, should be there. I, I find it very, very, very overwhelming trying to keep on top of everything. Who wants to go next? Well, I'll just piggyback on to that very point because I mean, social media, I think right at what Laura just said, profile raising is, um, is a very big thing. I, I hate to talk about fake news, but <laughs> there's been a lot of talk about the demise of book selling over the past, I don't know, five, 10 years that I find very disheartening because really book selling is not dying or fading away or going away. And I hope I don't say it 3000 times in this session about SIBA, but I'm really hoping that this is one of the, the goal, the roles that SIBA will fulfill. And that is to raise the profile of independent book selling in this country. I mean, we, we, we definitely need that, that for sure. We need the positive media spin and I'm hoping that we can provide that. But as Laura says, the, the online thing, um, well, and I've got some stats here today because I asked for them ahead of time, but I did discover that um, at least in book manager users, that the online sales from March, 2019 to March, 2021 increased 536% at independent bookstores. So that's huge for indie bookstores. And it means it's, as Laura mentioned, we're thrust into competition with a huge behemoth who's got all sorts of resources. And instead, like Kathy, I'm taping my hair into parcels <laughs> and you know, rushing over to the post office to be charged exorbitant rates to send a, one book to somebody. Those kinds of things, again, um, SIBA, I think, is really trying very hard to address those sorts of things. So that that's kind of something that is my personal mission in, in life. Yeah. Do you want me to go? Over to you, Kathy. Okay. What, I mean, I agree with everything that uh, both Laura and Shelley have said. I mean, certainly there is, my biggest concern is this little erosion of our businesses by people that, you know, in, insist on having immediate service and the best price. That is um, a huge concern because we are basically handing over our business to that big, um, the big A. And I think that um, we really need to be concerned about that and figure out a way as booksellers to educate the consumer um, because 
my customers, the people that come to my store know that when they come here, myself or any one of my staff, if they're looking for a book on anxiety or a book on autism, we are going to give them exactly what they're looking for because everybody is very well educated in what is going to be the best fit for the age, um, what the issue is, if it's anxiety, there's many different types of anxiety and we can get somebody uh, walking out the door with exactly what they're looking for. And you're not going to get that online because there's no way that you can get like, there'll be a whole bunch of lists of other resources that if you look at one book that have absolutely nothing to do with the book that you're actually looking at would be just based on algorithms. And I'm better than an algorithm. I can assure you of that. <laughs> and I think that that's something we definitely have to look at as independence is how do we educate the consumer? I mean, and back to what Shelley also said, I can't tell you how many times when I tell people that I own a bookstore, people say, do people still buy books? <laughs> Well, maybe they don't. <laughs> yeah. I can assure you, there's a lot of us out here still buying books and reading. Mm -hmm. And it's that, and to even educate people into just that tactile awareness of the touch and the smell and, you know, all of the things that happen with the experience. Um, that's really, really mm -hmm. important because I think that there is a whole element to it um, mm -hmm. that is just. Um, that for whatever reason is getting some bad press. So. Can I just I add just, one thing? Just mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, we, we've, we all three of us kind of touched on like the consumer and stuff, but I also think that, especially with SIBA, this could be something that would come up, but I also think there needs to be some like education around how um, Canadian publishers work with uh, in, indie booksellers as well. I think that there's, there's like a, there's an opportunity there that tends to be missed, um, especially with, you know, I see more and more, more and more Canadian publishers selling directly to the consumers, doing events themselves. And I, I understand that there is a, um, you know, there's a financial thing that's going on that's more behind the scenes, but I, I do think that there's a more, more opportunities for indies and, and the actual industry and publishers <laughs> one-on-one -on -one together, um, you know, for, for many, many, many ways. Mm. Yes. Good yeah. point, yeah. Um, thanks. I did have a question on the tip of my tongue. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to <laughs> uh, go back to Catherine, your point, and I think all three of you have sort of talked about the service levels um, when somebody asks, do people still buy books? Do you think they're referring to just print books or what are they talking about? Ebooks? Or are they talking about, you know, we, we do a, an annual leisure, uh, study, uh, leisure survey at BookNet Canada. So is, is the question coming from the fact that people just are doing all kinds of other things or is it just print book ebook i'm curious about that that's all what do you think about that i think the biggest competition we have right now and have for a long time is the handheld device more than anything else because and i i mean guilty myself but everyone is so attached to their phone or what have you and sp spend waste countless hours that you formerly would have spent reading <laughs> But yes, when people say, oh, do you still read? I think they actually mean paper books, but I could mm -hmm. be wrong. No, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that people um, don't necessarily always want to pay for information anymore. We need mm -hmm. yeah. accessibility to, um, and people can find all kinds of clever ways to, to, yeah. uh, to get something that they don't have to pay for. And I'll tell you, I can't, I have people that come in the store and they're getting out their phones and they're opening the book. And I'm like, no, no, no. You can take a picture of the cover, but inside content, you got to pay for. Yeah, good. And, but it is oblivious to some people because there is this sense that we should be able to find something for free. Yeah. So we don't We're just know. showrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That also, that also plays into, you know, the fact that these, these companies like Amazon, their, their entire goal is to devalue the product, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't, 
people don't realize that there's a, people who are getting paid behind the scenes, including the author, every time you purchase a book, right? Exactly. exactly. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I guess we should move into uh, our COVID stories. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, books always love stories. Their, their customers obviously love stories. Humans love stories. So with that in mind, we want you to each share your experience of COVID, specifically from a perspective of your businesses. But what are your COVID tales? What did you try that either failed uh, or that you won't try again or that succeeded? And what was that success? Um, Shelly, I think we start with you this time. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess the the first reaction is just that you react. You go into crisis mode. There's no playbook. Nobody's ever had to do this before. So you just you basically just you're in defensive strategy mode. <laughs> just keep the doors open if that's what you could do, or shut the doors if that's what you had to do, and. Um, try to regroup as quickly as you could. And I think, as I said in our practice session, the one thing that a lot of us had in place, although it was not being used very often, was a functioning web store, which a lot of my fellow merchants here in town had never had a website that all their merchandise was displayed on and that they sold from. So they were really scrambling, whereas I really just had to flip a switch. So that, that part was, was very key. But your, the first step was to just survive. And being a sole owner, you can be very flexible and you can try something. And if it doesn't work, you can try something else. And that I found is how I had to um, work. I kind of have an improver personality. So it, it stood me in good stead in, in this instance where I could just, I'm not gonna use that word pivot but where you could just turn on a dime and try and try, try something different. So the, the next thing was to go into offensive mode and of course do all the things that I think everybody probably did, which were on a thoroughfare. So, you know, making sure your window displays were changed all the time. We were very big on social media. We always had done social media, but we ramped it up a thousand fold. And I have never taken so many pictures in my life of books and things and puzzles. And you'd put a bunch of puzzles out on the floor and take a picture and put it on Instagram. And in literally 15 minutes, every puzzle was gone. It was <laughs> fascinating. And Anyway, that went on for a while and we had the support of our town and our mayor, our, my mayor was doing deliveries and some of the councillors, um, the BIA, of course, was struggling to try and keep up. Everybody was just doing their best. And then, you know, after a while, you kind of get the hang of it. And uh, then we kind of moved into the offensive mode where we started to ramp up our events again. We were big into events. We do a couple of hundred events a year normally. So we've brought our events back in, in this fashion, Zoom, and trying to keep them fresh and different and interesting and not, not like this one, maybe. <laughs> Bunch of talking heads. Um, anyway, so that, it, it, it's turned out to be surprisingly okay. In fact, sales are, up. It's it's astonishing, and a, and a lot of it. Even when we reopened, the e orders still kept coming in, and I think it's because once people have discovered how easy it is that it really does work, just like Amazon, then they're more inclined to continue doing it. So that's that's the story of Blue Heron in COVID. Awesome. Uh, over to Vancouver. All right. Well. We um, were never fully shut down and because we're mental health, they were, fell into that essential part, but there was only uh, myself and Nikki running the show for about four months. Um, we let people in, but very few. Um, most people did curbside pickup and we did offer free shipping for far too long, which was painful, <laughs> but 
initially we thought it was a gift to the community and then it was, um, then we had to cut it off because it's just too expensive to play that game. But we did want to uh, make people comfortable um, and still get materials. Um, we've done a few, all, all the events that we generally do are offsite, which is has been quite unfortunate because that is a huge part of what we do. We take our um, show on the road to, you know, autism events and fetal alcohol effect events and mental any other mental health events, anything around ending violence or you name it. If it related to something we were doing, we were generally on the road during the conference season. To, we could be out three or four times a week. So it was a, a huge part of what we did. And in the fall, when that started up again, um, there were uh, different organizations that were trying these web formats where you did kind of a, a booth, online booth, and those were not at all. They were so a lot of work and not um, very good at all. So the only thing that I did that actually I thought was worked really well was one of the groups had us do um, a slide presentation and describe materials and do a little like a 10 minute um, talk basically. And that was very good um, because they taped it, they shared it through all their social media and then we had a, a tremendous amount of response from that kind of thing. So that's the type of thing that um, I'll be encouraging the different people that we deal with now to try and do uh, because I think that 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 in, is much more interactive um, for participants for different events. Um, so that was good. Um, and the biggest issue and the thing that mostly was keeping me up at night um, is trying to get product. That has been a huge, huge issue. So I don't know whether it's because we're small independents and we're lower down on the totem pole, but like there was um, a couple of publishers that unless you bought full cases, you couldn't get shipments from them. And you had to order from a secondary distributor that never had product. And if we had to get anything, um, cause normally we would go, we had a, a site across um, the border that we would pick materials up from and do our own brokerage. So then having to go and have to uh, sort out that end of it as well and then get deliveries. Um, and then anything where that folks had run out of it that was coming from offshore was practically non-existent. So we were waiting four to six months to fill orders, which was very, very painful. And our customers were pretty reasonable. I would say 90% of them were really, really reasonable, but I don't even know how reasonable I would have been waiting that long. So I am very grateful <laughs> to all of them um, during that time. But those are the kind of things that I've found to be very challenging and, and hopefully evolving out of that now. Hmm. Thanks. Laura. Um, yeah, so we, we shut down completely for about, um, I don't even know now. I, I, <laughs> um, I think we shut down for about a month and a half. Uh, I, I feel like I make that number up because I don't even know if I remember that time. Um, to be honest, I've, I don't think I've ever worked so many long days before consistently. Um, it was mostly we shut, we didn't have to shut down. Um, mostly though, we were all just, the numbers in Toronto were really high. Um, we are very like community focused. The, we didn't know how it was spreading. We didn't, there were tons of things we just didn't want to make worse and we didn't want to have staff in the store um, who could, were, you know, potentially spreading it around, getting sick. So we just decided to completely shut down. Um, where only uh, myself and, and another colleague were coming into the shop. Um, Ange Angela, my events coordinator was amazing. Um, it was me and her pretty much every day. Uh, she went from working four days or four hours, uh, you know, in the store um, a week to like hanging out with me every day, ordering pizza and food and just like trying to get through, through it all. Um, we had, we had a website like Shelly, we had no online orders, uh, except for wholesale ever come through. And then all of a sudden two of us were just nonstop filling and packing and trying to, you know, 
what's cheaper, Canada Post or Pure Later, trying to find local delivery options, uh, biking around the city myself, just like dropping stuff off, walking stuff around. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, and there was like, we would, we would try anything and everything. So uh, we also took far too much on. Uh, that was one of the things that you don't realize how much personal time um, everything takes when everything's online. Uh, so, you know, everything's taking twice or three times as long to fill one order and you're there until midnight and you still have, you know, 17 other orders to go and you didn't get through them, but, you know, you're already so exhausted. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of how the first days were just a blur and just anything that would stick, let's try. Uh, we did team up with a local uh, courier company, Send It, uh, who had that has really helped us. Um, also, the community really uh, appreciates us. They're a um, they're not only a bike courier company, but they are a, I believe they're a co-op. They are so they're run like a union, and uh, they're um, they kind of like fit with with the shop. So people were really excited about that. Um, and and then yeah, just. The, the, the biggest issue was the wholesale side of things. So another story bookshop is most, what keeps us going to be, to be truthful is our wholesale side of the business. So we work with school boards to get books into classrooms and we work with teachers and librarians and March and April are our big vendor fairs. So I had already ordered all of our stock for these vendor fairs. So I'm on stock that I don't know how I'm gonna pay for. Um, and, you know, the, 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 our specialty is actually going out, um, kind of like the conferences that Catherine was talking about, we would go and we would sell to schools, we'd go into schools, we would be really hands-on showing teachers, you know, what uh, the titles are, talking about them, because a lot of the titles that we, we sell are, hard, like, we read everything. I pay staff to read books so that they have the knowledge and understanding of, you know, what, what this book's about, what are the sens sensitivities, what's the age range, what it fits with, what it wouldn't work with, um, trauma issues, stuff like that. So that we had to really pivot <laughs> because we, we, we never did this before. We have a YouTube channel now where we will like do links for different schools um, and that's, that's been fantastic. And people really enjoy that. We get a lot of really good feedback um, where we do book recommendations. It's, it's hard to do book recommendations over the phone. Um, so trying, and, and also it's, it's not very, Zoom, while it's, while it's great, it's sometimes you just need like a presentation style format where it's like, this is what I'm gonna show you. And you know, question and answer period comes later, but this is just everything that I want to say about it. So that's something that we, you know, we've never had a YouTube channel before. We do now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with our events, uh, again, just uh, feeding off Catherine. There's, um, they're just they're they're worth it in terms of like promotion and like making sure because we really try to pair up with authors that we we love and we want to support. We want to make sure that their books are, are, are known and get out there, but we don't sell anything. So, I mean, I hope that, you know, people for the author's sake are, are going someplace else to pick up their book or they're tuning into our event and maybe picking them up because, you know, they're a Blue Heron customer or they're a type customer or they're in the East End. So they, you know, shop at Queen. But for us, it's, it's, it ends up being a lot of work and no, no reward, um, especially when payroll, right? Uh, the, the thing that kind of kept us through was wage subsidy. It was, um, we give sick days. So uh, everyone gets a standard two weeks anyways, paid sick days a year. Um, and then we were able to give an additional two weeks on top of that uh, for COVID related stuff. And we're really flexible with that anyways. Um, but wage subsidy helped, and there was a government loan that helped us. But I just, you know, trying trying to balance everything was it was really hard, and it still is. Like we are mm -hmm. to this day, you know, 
trying trying to get money, you know, from orders that shipped, you know, six months ago because schools have closed or they're open or people are working from home. And it's it's, it's a lot to manage when my 18 staff are now down to, you know, was down to two and then we slowly keep adding. Um, but I don't know when I'll be able to have full staff back in the store again. We're still not open because, because of that. Like, you know, as I mentioned earlier that my biggest concern is, you know, community and, and staffing. And, and so if I'm gonna open my doors, I, I want to have full staff first before I let customers into browse because, you know, people need their jobs back. Hmm. Thanks. So we are at 146. We don't have any questions coming in yet, but uh, I have a few more here, but I'm just gonna try to bundle it um, because bundles are popular online, so. Uh, uh, so, I, I mean, I'm just hearing so much stuff. It's just a lot to think about for sure. Um, so let me try to knock this one out of the park, but I probably won't. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of support from your communities, even though they're, they seem really different. There's some overlapping for sure, but your specialties make your communities different for each one of you. Uh, where you are, Toronto, Vancouver, Uxbridge, really different. Um, and then that online piece, which we know is uh, a lot of effort. It's great that you're able to pivot so quickly to another channel. Um, so here's my question, let us see. Uh, consumer behavior, uh, your view of your customers and their requests during this time, how have the requ requests changed over time? Have you noticed changing trends in what your customers are buying? Um, sort of bundled in here a little bit, I'd like you to talk about what's sustainable going forward. So on the other side of COVID, uh, when the new normal is back, what things are you gonna take away from your experience here and continue to uh, apply and maybe put more effort behind? And then the third and final part of this three-part question, which is not really a part, is about SIBA. Uh, so we know, uh, independent booksellers lost the CBA, got rolled into the RCC. They kind of felt disenfranchised through that big organization. But now you have a dedicated independent uh, bookseller uh, association, uh, national. And I know that we have three different views on it here. Catherine, you're not a member. Laura, you are a member, but not engaged. And Shelly, you are on the board. So if you want to talk about your expectations of SEBA, I don't know if you can, <laughs> you can take one of those questions or all three of them, uh, depending on how your mind is feeling. And I think we're going to start with Laura on this one, if Laura um, wants to go first. Yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, so I guess the. The one kind of, the one sustainable thing, the thing that I want to keep, and I think we all want to keep in place, like us, myself and my colleagues, um, is trying to maintain uh, the online presence. That was one thing that, you know, if you would have asked me six months ago, I would have said, no way, like as soon as we open, we're shutting our online store down, it's done, I'm done with it, we're not a warehouse. Um, and and I completely change that. So that's that's one thing that we will try and do. We will keep trying to work with the community um, to you know make it as accessible as possible. Um, and you know we might phase out curbside pickups because we have just no room for <laughs> curbside. If you can make it to the store, you know then maybe that's something that we'll get rid of. But but definitely major online presence I think is really important for us, which is something that we never really had to think about before. Um, the, 
in terms of how how our customers and our, like the buying has changed. I mean, buying for myself in the store, I'm still like so like social justice and equity is still our focus, and that is what is on our shelves. Uh, during this last year, uh, the back backlist, uh, which you know we 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 do carry certain backlist titles, but uh, that has kind of you know, and I, I do think it's it's again anyone can order from us. So we kind of became this general bookshop in people's minds where, you know, when you go onto our website, you know, there's, we have 12,000 titles in stock, but then you have every other books, book that's out there that you can get from us. So people, you know, they might not see the books on our shelves that they want, but they want to support us. So now they're ordering classics that we just don't have room for, you know, our classic section is like this small. <laughs> Because it's just, you know, anyone who's ever been to another store knows how, how tiny we are. So we can't keep everything, everything that we do even want to keep anyways. Um, so that was really interesting. Seeing those, like, you know, people just realizing that, hey, I don't have to go to Amazon to, to get this title. I can actually order it and my local bookshop can get it for me, you know, in about a week's time. And so people were almost surprised by that, that we have that type of access, which was something that I, I was you know, pleasantly surprised that being more online was getting that information out there. Um, and then as far as SIBA goes, uh, I'm really excited that there is an organization. Um, I am a member of the American Booksellers Association as well. And I uh, per participate in their like coffee talks and they do a bunch of things that's like, you know, kind of like industry relevant uh, dialogue between booksellers. I have gotten a lot of information from American booksellers, like since being an owner um, about, you know, I think too, it's like, because, because America is just so big and there's so many different bookstores. I've found bookstores that are very similar in size and similar in, you know, kind of like like politics and, and like what 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 I do, um, so the owners have the same types of uh, struggles that we have, and also the same types of successes. So that's been really nice to engage with, and I can't wait to be able to have a platform like SIBA where I can sit down and actually engage with other booksellers. Who you know, again, there's a lot of new bookstores opening up, um, and you know, brick and mortar, and also online. So I, I think that just to be able to say, hey, I, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge in front of me. I want to try this. I know that it's, e it's either been a success or failed somewhere. Give me some feedback. So that's, that's my biggest, you know, my, bi my biggest excitement from, from SIPA forming is that connection with other booksellers that up until this time, I just haven't, haven't had. Thanks, Laura. Catherine? Well, I think from the sustainability or going forward piece, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen. Like they discussed the fourth wave being the mental health challenges everyone's going to have after COVID is over, because I think it's going to be really difficult for people to get back to whatever normal is going to look like with regards to um, you know, lots, a lot more anxiety, a lot more concern about being in spaces, sharing spaces with people. Uh, for some people who really haven't um, found a need to really worry about it at all, from the other extreme to people that have been hyper vigilant. And I think that there's, um, there's definitely going to be something more support. I think that's needed there, and I'm hoping that um, the government is looking at that because that's going to be. Uh, something I think that's going to be challenging for years to come. Um, I think again back to hoping that we haven't had erosion from uh, people getting used to shopping in a certain way and, and not with independent booksellers. Um, so definitely hoping that we still are able to sustain where we're at um, going forward. I think that there is, um, for us, we're looking at whether or not we take um, the space that we have and shrink it 
and focus more on the more the institutionalized um, stuff we do with schools and ministry and family services and um, corrections and a whole lot of other groups that we deal with directly. Um, because I don't want to be having to um, solve puzzles forever as much as I love puzzles. They don't really fit what we do. And the ones that we do um, will continue on with are only the ones that are um, beautiful ones done by local Indigenous artists that have been made into puzzles that are produced locally. Those would be the only thing that I can see that we carry that fits with what we do as just another piece of a a sensory tool so if it fits with that that it fits what our mandate is so I want to get rid of everything that we've kind of been experimenting with um, that is in that gray area and kind of get back to the essence of of who we are and why we started this all in the first place and I think that that's really you know probably for all of us that have been experimenting and dabbling and trying to figure out where we all fit in is yeah we we just need to get back to that essence of of what um, what we all started out on this journey to do. And I'm looking forward to getting back to that because right now we just run around like our pants are on fire and hope for the best <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and up to you, Shelley. Um, well, I'll just make two quick points about the, what Laura said about uh, patterns, customer patterns being surprised. Well, you're you were a little surprised by your customers. Well, your customers were surprised by what you had, and I guess so were mine. And but I was surprised by what they were ordering, and I was so frustrated. I would open up order after order, and I I contemplated because in Book Manager you can shut off so they can't you, you can only show what's in stock and then they'd have to order what was on the shelf and there I had thousands of titles and each order would come in with many titles and not one of them did I have on the shelf and every day I'd sit there and go oh my god I am going to order every day I'm going to be ordering and it it was driving me crazy but then eventually I let go of that and I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go where the wind is blowing me, where the customers are leading. And I think a lot of people hadn't read a book in <clears throat> 20 years and probably said mm -hmm. to their buddy, hey, what's a good book? And buddy hadn't read a book in 20 years. And so it was all definitely not front list. It was <laughs> way back list, deep back list. And a lot of things that I would never ordinarily have had or ordered. And, but that told me a lot because does that mean I have been getting it all wrong all along? Do I have the wrong things? Um, I didn't have huge orders with Rain Coast because I, the return thing, which is expensive, suddenly Rain Coast must just think that I, I'm great now because my Rain Coast orders are huge. And it's, it was interesting to follow the, the pattern of the customer and realize that, yeah, deep backlist is, is a good thing too. And there's nothing wrong with uh, having that on the shelf. The other piece is the social media thing because it was just myself and one other person doing all the work. And I did know someone who was very good at social media who was unemployed. I was able to hire them to take on the social media piece. And as I say, that just ramped up incredibly. And that is something I will, will keep because I can see the cause and effect of that instantaneously. As I mentioned about the puzzles, but even now I can post a book uh, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and be standing there and 15 minutes later, someone come in and say, oh yeah, I just saw that post. Can I have that book that you just posted wow. on Instagram? It's like, woo, mm -hmm. okay. So that was good. Mm -hmm. And um, as to the SIBA bit, um, just following on what Laura said about communicating, um, I guess that for me, the easiest way to remember the three things that we're trying to do is to, to make them rhyme because that's how my brain works. So it's communicate <laughs> was number one for me, communicate, educate, and advocate. And well, maybe commiserate now, I don't know, but <laughs> communicate is, is huge, is huge. We're so spread out. And I've just learned about the two of you guys so much more 
and I realize how enriching that is and how, you know, if I needed a book for a certain specific anxiety, Kathy, I'd be calling you now and saying, hey, can you help me with this? And I, I think that that collegiality with with SIBA is going to be great. I mean, there's there's a member portal, there's social media groups and so on. And I think that is, is going to be a, a big piece of it, I'm hoping. Um, the also communicating, of course, with suppliers, that's big. And we talked about the shop local button, which is already a success and it is um, open to any bookseller. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be if you see an author or a publisher posting about a new book and it's, you know, buy Amazon, click here, Indigo, and now there'll be shop local and it will search for the, using the postal code for the closest store and actually search the inventory if you supply that data to them. And then educate, of course, we're doing lectures and labs and things like this, but also more hands-on uh, labs where you would actually discuss something very specific like uh, doing your returns or what have you and then uh, advocate is really important and I think we have already made some progress there and the biggest one for all of us I think well having the collective voice to go forth is so important because blue heron books approaching the government is you know nothing but all the booksellers in Canada approaching is is a much bigger deal and so we have gone we we have a um, proposal in the hands of the um, Minister of Finance and the Department of Canadian Heritage for the book rate and it's a joint uh, proposal with the Quebec booksellers so I mean we're coming with both languages which is more powerful of course and it's looking pretty good um so i mean that would be a big coup that would be a big win and i think it would encourage um other booksellers to join if they could see that collectively we have gone and we have scored we've we've actually produced something so the shop local button already exists and that was one of the first things we did the trying to get the post or the book rate is number two it's a big deal and oh my goodness i really hope that it i and i i'm feeling very hopeful i think that we're going to score on that one too so i would encourage anybody to join because you're going to uh we're going to do great things together thank you thank you all i'm going to uh kick it back over to lauren where our time here is done thanks for all your insightful answers. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for ending on the pitch to join SIBA. You can learn more about SIBA at SIBABooks.ca. And those words, communicate, educate, and advocate are a great way, great way to end today. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, Shelly, for that, as well as to Catherine and to Laura for joining us today, as well as Tim. We really appreciate having you at today's webinar. Finally, we'd like to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage for their support through the Canada Book Fund. And again, thank you to Catherine, Laura, Shelly, and Tim, as well as SIBA Books.